Hello everybody, we're going to get into an exciting topic now in the realm of geotechnical earthquake engineering and that's the topic of soil liquefaction. Now, Soil liquefaction has always occurred whenever there's been earthquakes but we didn't really recognize it as its own phenomenon until uh, certainly the 1900s. I think there was a lot of evidence that, that we knew something was going on in the big earthquakes in the 1920s in Japan, the 1930s in California. But in the 1960s, in particular, two large earthquakes occurred, the 1964 earthquake in Niigata, Japan, and then the 1964 earthquake in the Prince William Sound near Anchorage, Alaska. And both of those earthquake events produced an enormous amount of liquefaction that had researchers and engineers scratching their heads. And so in the 1960s, a huge push to <clears throat> understand and perform research on soil liquefaction began. And it really is, is kind of the baseline, I guess, or, or the, um, the fundamental principles of what we're going to talk about in this lecture. So <clears throat> since the 1960s, we've learned a lot about the mechanics behind soil liquefaction and so let's review some of those right here. Consider if we had a saturated loose sand <coughs> as this little cartoon here shows. Now this we know that the sand is loose because you can see the void space in between the sand particles is very very large. If the particles, if the sand particles were any closer together the, that void space in between the sand particles would be smaller. Now if we applied a shear force to these sand particles, it's going to force these sand particles to rearrange and reconfigure themselves relative to one another. So you can imagine that this row of sand is going to slide this way and this row of sand might slide a little bit that way. And the result is going to look something like this. Now if I pause <coughs> the, uh, the entire uh, mechanism in the process. All I did was I, I moved the sand particles over to the right. Now if I have drained conditions what's going to happen is these sand particles are going to try to settle and come back into contact with one another and they're going to push the water out of the way. And the water can get out of the way because it's a drained condition. Because it's drained the water can get out easily and uh, what ends up happening is the ground settles and we, we have a compaction, so to speak, or a consolidation. But once the particles come back into contact, they've regained their strength again and, and the, the soil is dense and stiff. Now let's reset. If our particles are suspended again in this manner, but we have undrained conditions, meaning the, the sand particles want to settle down. They want to consolidate down into the void space. But the problem is that the water's in the way. There's nothing, uh, and there's because it's undrained, there's nowhere for the water to go. So as a result, the water pushes back. And because the pore water can't escape, essentially then the, the soil particles hydroplane on the water that's in the void space and for a very temporary period the soil particles have um, or the soil itself has very little to no shear strength. Um, so it's important to remember that this is a temporary condition because remember this is a loose sand. Um, usually when we think about undrained soils we think of clays or the things with low permeability and the reason that it it's this way in sand is because all of the sand is trying to compact itself and squeeze the water out simultaneously at the same time. And because all of the water is trying to get out at the same time, um, it can't do it fast enough. And so there's a backup. And as a result of that, we get the undrained um, condition in sand. So that's the basic mechanism behind liquefaction. Now let's zoom out and let's look at liquefaction from a larger or a higher elevation. There are essentially two general types of soil liquefaction. <coughs> the first type <coughs> is referred to as flow liquefaction. And flow liquefaction is characterized by a sudden and a usually a catastrophic soil deformation. So let's say that this, whoops, <coughs> 
let's say that this soil here on the slope liquefies, and because it liquefies, it can't hold itself up under its own weight. So because of that, that soil is going to flow down slope like this. And we can get some tremendous ground deformations. And, um, you know, this is the type of effect that um, can really cause some damage and, and can hurt people because it happens very quickly and usually without warning. Now, the second type of liquefaction is not as dramatic, but certainly can be just as damaging to infrastructure, and it's called cyclic mobility. Now, in cyclic mobility, the soil liquefies, and as it liquefies and the ground motions are still occurring that are going to shake the ground back and forth, what ends up happening is the soil also begins to lurch back and forth on top of this liquefied soil. And if there's anything like a, an open canal or if there's a gradient um, or the slope in the ground, the, every time we get some ground motions, we may end up actually seeing permanent deformations and cracking in the ground. And uh, which can lead to an effect known as lateral spreading. <coughs> so cyclic mobility can result in significant ground deformations, um, but they're just not as dramatic or as sudden as flow liquefaction. So whenever we talk about or address the topic of liquefaction, there are three critical aspects that we need to consider. The first critical aspect is susceptibility of a particular soil to uh, undergo liquefaction. The second is liquefaction initiation. If my soil is susceptible, will it liquefy under a given level of ground, mo uh, ground motion? Then the third question is, the effects. So if my soil is susceptible and I do predict that it will liquefy under the design ground motions, what are going to be the effects from that liquefaction? And so if we frame the problem of liquefaction um, in this light with these three critical questions or things that we need to address, we can be objective and um, repetitive in the way that we analyze liquefaction. Let's talk first about liquefaction susceptibility. Now we know, we know that not all soils are prone to liquefaction. And um, we can, if we identify these soils ahead of time, we can um, wave our magic wand and remove them from the analysis and, and so that they won't contribute to the problem. And there's different levels of criteria that we use to establish susceptibility. So for instance, <coughs> if <clears throat> There's evidence that liquefaction has occurred at our site at some time in the past, then that's kind of a deal killer. We know right off the bat that liquefaction is likely and probable to occur in the future. So um, liquefaction tends to occur in the same places over and over again. It tends to repeat itself. And so if a site has liquefied in the past, then we know it can have great confidence it will probably liquefy again in the future. Another criteria that we use is called geologic criteria, and this is an important one, and it's often overlooked by engineers, though um, in my opinion it shouldn't be. We know that certain geologic depositional mechanisms lend more to liquefiable soils than others. So for instance, we know that um, soils that are deposited alluvially or fluvially or aeolian, like through wind um, action, that, that those types of deposits tend to be the most susceptible to liquefaction. We also know that soils that uh, are granular in nature, that have few fines, and that are uniform in their size and their particle distribution, are also they also tend to be more susceptible. Soils that are shallow, you know, usually less than 15 meters below the ground surface <clears throat> and, and preferably less than 10 meters and that are saturated and that are young. So relatively recent, particularly deposited in the last, last 10,000 years. Those types of soils are the most susceptible 
to liquefaction. Another type of criteria is called the compositional criteria. And compositional criteria looks at the type of the soil, not how it was deposited or how old it is, but how, which is really like what the classification or the type of the soil is. Um, we know that poorly graded, cohesionless, and gravel to coarse silts are the most likely candidates for liquefaction. Um, however, we've learned in the last, uh, I would say, 11 years or so that many low plasticity fine soils can also liquefy. Uh, for instance, you see this plot down here. This comes from, um, uh, it looks like this one was probably out of, uh, taken from a publication of Boulanger and Idris. And it talks about uh, the different criteria. Uh, now, Bray and Sancio, 2006, recommended that um, anything less than a plasticity index of 12 um, should be considered susceptible to liquefaction. Oh, and it also has to have a water content greater than 85% of the liquid limit, and the liquid limit needs to be less than 37%. If those criteria apply, then Bray and Sancio say, yes, assume that the soil is susceptible. Now, Idris and Boulanger, they take a little less conservative approach, and they say, no, the line should be somewhere around a PI of 7. So if, you're less, if your plasticity index is less than 7, and these criteria apply, then yes, you should consider your low plasticity fine soil to be susceptible to uh, liquefaction. Now there's a lot of argument between these two camps. Is, is the plasticity index 12 or 7? 12 or 7? And really I think that um, what has been decided is that if your soil falls within this range between a plasticity index of um, five or 7 and 12, that maybe you consider testing it in the laboratory to see if under the design ground motions that you're anticipating for your site, if it will liquefy. Now another type of susceptibility is what we call the state criteria. The state criteria has to do with whether or not the soil is what we call um, loose or dense. Now, loose soils tend to liquefy. Dense soils tend to dilate and not liquefy. Now, um, the late Professor Arthur Casagrande in, the in 1936 presented a very critical idea called the critical void ratio. And according to this theory, um, Casagrande stated that all soils, regardless of whether they're dense or loose, when you try to shear them, they try, uh, the, the soils try to make their way to a line that he called the critical void ratio line. And it doesn't matter if you shear the soil in a drained manner or an undrained manner that the soil is going to try to make its way to that line. So for instance, if I have a dense soil and I'm draining it in a drained manner, that means that my confining stress is not going to change because I'm not adding any additional pore pressure during the loading because the, the test is drained. But what's happening is I am allowing the volume of my soil to change and the void ratio to change along with it. If my point is here and I'm keeping my stress constant, that means that my point has to go up to eventually reach the critical void ratio line. If it's going up, that means that my void ratio is increasing, which means that I have dilation. So my soil is expanding in its volume. Now conversely, if I have an undrained test, and I'm still testing that same dense soil, uh, undrained means that my void ratio is not going to change. I'm going to have constant volume during my test. But it also means that I'm going to generate excess pore pressures during the shearing action in the test. Now if my point's here, the only way it can get to um, this line is, without changing volume, is to go straight over to the right. 
So if I'm going straight to the right, that means that I'm gaining effective stress. And if I'm gaining effective stress, that means my pore pressure is going to be negative because we know that effective stress equals total stress minus pore pressure. So if I have a negative pore pressure and I'm subtracting a negative pore pressure, I'm going to get um, an increase in my effective stress. So again, that's due to dilation. So this theory then of the critical void ratio um, it, it's a function of both the effective confining stress and the initial void ratio. Um, so regardless of where my soil sits relative to this critical void ratio line is, is going to tell me whether or not I have a loose soil or a dense soil. If my soil sits above the critical void ratio line, it's a loose soil and it's considered susceptible to liquefaction. Now this theory was widely accepted um, in the early 1930s and mid-1930s, but there was a problem with it. The problem was that the Fort Peck Dam in 1938 failed, and it was designed based on this theory, uh, and it fell due to liquefaction. And this remained a mystery for a few decades, until later Casa Grande's PhD student, um, Castro, in 1969 and then later in 1976, published some of the results from his PhD work, and he made a few important discoveries. <clears throat> he started testing the undrained strength of soils at various um, initial void ratios and effective confining stresses. And here's some of the things he found. Let, let's say um, what I have here is I have stress paths. Oh, actually, whoops, I'm sorry. This is the stress path. This is the stress strain curve, and we have a pore pressure versus strain curve down here. And all of them are plotting um, the paths for these three different soils that Casa Grande was testing. And so what we saw, for instance, for a loose soil <coughs> is something that we would <coughs> totally expect. <coughs> for the loose soil, we'd expect to see a little bit of whoops, a little bit of strain hardening, and then a sudden drop in our strength, and then huge strains. That corresponds with a stress path that drops dramatically and approaches some uh, the failure envelope at point A. And in terms of pore pressure, the excess pore pressure, because it's loose and contractive, we expect to see a big increase in our excess pore pressures during that process. So that's a soil that liquefied. Now, um, if we look at soil B, that's a dense soil. Uh, this is a soil we'd expect to dilate, meaning that it's going to gain strength with strain because of the vacuum effect and the negative pore pressures that generate during shear. And because of that, my stress path goes to the right not to the left. Whenever I have dilation, my stress path goes to the right. If I have contraction, my stress path goes to the left. And then I get a little bit of initial um, increase in my pore pressure, and then my pore pressure goes negative, <clears throat> creating a vacuum and suction within my soil that adds to it um, a, an additional or a false sense of strength. So that's soil B. Now soil C, is what we call a medium dense soil, and it's something between the loose soil of A and the dense soil of B. And this is where Castro saw some interesting behavior. He saw, for instance, some initial strain hardening, and then it started to strain soften, like the liquefied soil, but then it started to dilate and harden, like the dilative soil. In terms of stress paths, it, again, softened, and then had a sudden change in direction and it started to dilate until it hit the failure envelope of point C. And he called that point the phase transformation point. That's the point where the stress path changed its direction abruptly. In terms of pore pressures, there was a slight increase initially as the soil began to soften, but then it went negative as the soil began to dilate. And so Casa Grande referred to this term as limited liquefaction. We don't really use that terminology today. What we know is that um, all soils tend to show some contractive 
behaviors if they're loaded long enough or loaded at a high enough amplitude. But uh, this limited liquefaction behavior just is, uh, is the behavior of soil that is between a loose and a dense soil. So I want to point out this one point here where the liquefied soil dives to. It, uh, when the soil liquefies and it jumps down and hits the failure envelope, it's going to hit it at what we call the steady state strength. And we call that strength S sub SU. <clears throat> and think of this as the residual shear strength for the liquefied soil. So what Castro started doing is began plotting the void ratio of the soil at the steady state. I mean, in other words, after the soil hit that steady state strength on the failure envelope. And what he noticed was um, that a couple of things. First of all, the volume of the sample became constant. Its void ratio wasn't changing anymore once it reached that steady state, even though um, uh, we know that it was still an undrained test. And so what he saw when he started plotting this behavior was what we call the steady state line. And it's very similar to the critical void ratio line that his PhD advisor had discovered decades before. But it's not the same line. In fact, it lies just slightly below it. And it represents the true or the actual boundary between contractive and dilative behavior under undrained shearing conditions. See, what went wrong with um, with Casa Grande's work was back in the 1930s, we really didn't have a good way to perform undrained shear tests. And so his theory was solely developed based on, well, theory. But it, it didn't have any testing to back it up. And, and so Cast or Castro's work is so important because now we're able to show that uh, if, if you test the soil in an undrained manner, it almost shifts the critical void ratio line. And we use then that steady state line to tell us whether a soil is contractive and in other words susceptible to liquefaction or dilative and in other words not susceptible to liquefaction. So that wraps up everything we need to talk about with susceptibility. So again, an engineer would look at soil and would ask the question, is this soil susceptible to liquefaction? And they could look at historic, and geologic, and compositional, and state criteria to try to answer that question. Now, if the, question, if the answer to that question is yes, the soil is susceptible to liquefaction, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the soil will liquefy for sure if exposed to an earthquake. And that's because the initiation of liquefaction also depends on the magnitude and the duration of the loading that we apply to the soil. So consider the stress paths that are shown in these plots below. What we have is five specimens of soil, all prepared at the same relative density. But all we're doing is consolidating them and shearing them in an undrained manner at different confining stresses. As such, you can see that some of these soils plot below the steady state line and some of these soils plot above the steady state line, which means that the soils on, on top are contractive and the soils below are dilative. Now, if I start loading, say, soil C up, I can load it, load it, load it monotonically. And if I were to stop at any time, the soil would be fine. Um, but if I were to load it up to a certain point, at that point, once it reaches a certain point, there's no stopping it. It just flies down to the steady state strength and, and resides there. Uh, the same with soil D. If I load the soil D up, and I keep loading it up, it's the um, effective stress path starts moving to the left because of contractive um, or positive pore pressures due to contraction of the soil. Eventually it hits a point where it just dives to the steady state strength. Same with soil E. Once it hits that point, it just dives to the steady state strength. Conversely, if I have like soil A, 
if I load soil A up, it has to go to the right in terms of a stress path, which means then that um, as it goes to the right, that implies dilation. And it's also going to travel to the steady state point. So all of these paths are flying to the steady state point. The only difference is these three soils right here, C, D, and E, reached a point where there was no going back. And once they reached that certain critical point, the strength of the soils degraded rapidly, and there was no stopping it. And in fact, if we were to take that, um, so I've got a little bit of labels there that popped up. If we were to take the point of no return for each of those stress paths, we could plot a line through those points. And we can call that line the flow liquefaction surface. So the flow liquefaction surface um, defines the line or the surface, if you want to think of it that way, where if the stress path hits it, uh, flow liquefaction is initiated and the stress path rapidly dives to the steady state strength, or to the steady state point on the failure envelope. Now the flow liquefaction surface is the envelope in PQ space where rapid loss of shear strength is initiated or triggered. And this will often result in a liquefaction flow failure if the soil is unable to hold up its own weight at that point. So each soil has its own unique flow liquefaction surface that can be identified through shear testing in the laboratory. And the angle of that flow liquefaction surface, uh, we can call it psi sub L. And all we know is that whenever the, the uh, whenever the stress path of our soil hits that surface, it will initiate flow and the soil <coughs> will rapidly um, reduce its strength to the um, steady state strength. Now in terms of these different stress paths, if I look at stress path A and B, this is just from monotonic static loading. As I load the soil monotonically, positive pore pressure start to generate which caused my stress path to bend and move to the left. Once it hits the flow liquefaction surface at point B, it dives rapidly down to the steady state strength. Conversely, I can also get there if I do cyclic loading. So if I'm at the same starting point and I start to load my soil cyclically, every cycle generates pore pressure. And excess pore pressure causes my confining stress to reduce, so it, my stress path starts moving to the left. Eventually, it ratchets itself and will hit point D on the, on the flow liquefaction surface, and then it dives down to the steady state strength. So what does this mean then? Well, it means that if my initial stress state of the soil is greater than the steady state strength, which is located right there, then the soil will experience flow liquefaction if sufficient stress is applied to drive the stress path to my flow liquefaction surface. So all this region that's shaded here is the region where a soil is susceptible to flow liquefaction. And if the stress path of that soil ever hits that flow liquefaction surface, it will trigger flow liquefaction, and you'll see um, a rapid and um, unstoppable reduction in the soil shear strength. So we then would call this zone the zone susceptible to flow liquefaction. But what if what about this stuff down here? What if my what if my soil's initial stress state is down here and I start wanting to load it up either cyclically or I want to load it up monotonically? Well, if that's the case, then um, we have a soil that is susceptible to cyclic mobility. If the initial stress state of the soil is down here, um, the initial stress state is already less than the steady state strength. So 
What that means is that if my soil ever makes it to the steady state strength, well, guess what? It's a gain in strength because that point is higher than my initial stress. So um, we don't have a sudden or a drastic drop in strength. But what we get with cyclic mobility is the ability to ratchet back and forth, back and forth, until we eventually make our way to the failure envelope, and then we start diving back and forth on the failure envelope with every cycle of our loading. So this region that's shaded here is the region that is susceptible to cyclic mobility. It's important that you guys know these two regions both the region susceptible to flow liquefaction and the region susceptible to cyclic mobility. Now let's just give you three scenarios of how cyclic mobility might initiate. The first scenario is our initial uh, shear stress in the soil plus the shear stress from the earthquake is less than our undrained or our steady state shear strength and the, the difference between our initial shear strength and the static, or, or I'm sorry, the initial shear stress and the shear stress induced by the earthquake is greater than zero. What that means is my cycles, my stress path is staying on the positive side of the x-axis. And in, in this scenario, it's going to take a lot of cycles to get all the way back until I fail on the failure envelope and then I just go back and forth along the failure envelope. Now in scenario B, it's similar to the first one with the exception that my initial shear stress plus the shear stress from my earthquake is greater than my steady state undrained strength. So in other words, as I come up, each one of these peaks, if I were to come over, is larger than my steady state strength right there. And so that eventually means that my stress path is going to hit the flow liquefaction surface, but right at the bottom. But it doesn't really do anything. All it does is accelerate the strain in these little regions where the uh, stress path hits that surface, but we don't have catastrophic uh, losses of strength. And the reason for that, again, is because my initial stress is less than my steady state stress. The third example is an interesting one. It's where the initial shear stress plus the shear stress induced by the earthquake is less than the initial or the steady state strength of the soil, but the initial stress minus the stress of the earthquake is less than zero. And what that means is that my stress path has a stress reversal where it's positive and then it goes negative temporarily and then goes positive and then goes negative again. Whenever I have a stress reversal, that really, that really um, increases the change in my effective stress and my excess uh, I'm sorry, it, it increases the um, excess poor water pressure and the change in that excess poor water pressure. And so it accelerates the onset of liquefaction whenever we have those stress reversals. So let's review a couple things about liquefaction initiation. Um, we know that the initiation of liquefaction is going to depend on the stress state, whether or not the soil is contractive, or dilative, and that depends on its location relative to the steady state line. If my uh, initial stress state is above the steady state line, then my soil is contractive. If my steady or my initial stress state is below the steady state line, then my soil is dilative. Now it also depends on the duration of the loading. If I have enough cycles, I can move my way all the way to the left over to the failure envelope. And it also um, depends upon the amplitude of my loading. If my amplitude is large enough that I can actually introduce some stress reversals in my stress path, 
then we can really accelerate the generation of pore pressures. Now we know that flow liquefaction occurs when the initial shear stress in the soil is greater than the steady state undrained strength of the soil. And the duration or the amplitude of the loading is sufficient enough to push the stress path of the soil and to touch the flow liquefaction surface. If that happens, flow liquefaction will initiate. And finally, cyclic mobility occurs when flow liquefaction doesn't. And it occurs <coughs> as the pore pressures in our water accumulate with every loading cycle. So every cycle of back and forth in the loading is going to incrementally increase the pore water pressure. Um, and especially if we have a stress reversal in our cycles. And as eventually, if, we, if it goes on long enough, the stress path will hit the failure envelope and then the soil liquefies. So that's the end of this uh, part one of liquefaction. As we go into part two, we're going to discuss specifically how engineers today can predict whether or not a soil is going to liquefy on their site. So appreciate your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture.